You know, it's been a while since I had a baby in the house. But I do remember when my girls were really, really little and they would be in fear or they'd be in pain. And the repetitiveness of bouncing them on my arm, patting them on the back and humming to them would begin to soothe their system. It wasn't just I bounced them one time, patted them on the back one time and they automatically stopped. It had to be a repetitive process of letting them know that daddy saw them, he heard them, he was with them and that they were safe and that I saw the pain and fear that they were in before they began to calm. We're going to talk about today, repetitiveness in the EFT process. Welcome to the Leading Edge in Emotionally Focused Therapy with your hosts, Dr. James Hawkins and Dr. Ryan Reyna. EFT is a dynamic model that humbles even the most seasoned therapists. Together, we want to come alongside you as you continually push the leading edge of your understanding and application of this wonderful model developed by Dr. Sue Johnson. So here's why we picked up this topic, and I think it is important. You know, just like we want to pay to pay attention to when our clients repeat themselves right? and working in repetition, people repeat themselves because they're not being heard or something's not being seen, even if they don't know they're doing it. It's amazing how their brain and body keeps them doing it. You know, we said it just on the last podcast, the body is trying to put out a signal to get an attuned response. But anyway, uh, I've noticed in trainings a couple of times, Ryan, um, I'll talk about this skill, particularly in the a very important EFT uh, intervention and risk The first R being repeat, repeat, repeat. The necessity of being able to do repetition and that sometimes for uh, trainees, they have a little bit of a protest to it or wonderment like, um, is it really necessary to repeat? Am I going to look silly to the client when I repeat? Um, And so we want to take some moment on on this podcast to address when, what, what are we talking about when we say repetitiveness? Like, what do we repeat? When do we repeat? And what's the function and purpose of of repetition? All right. So one, when we are talking about repetition here and repeating, just as I use the teaser and talking about my my kids, it is something of of the neurological system. It's the body and the brain. We're talking about using repetition, not just repeating senseless words or any moment, every phrase we're parroting. What we're talking about being repetitive about is about the emotion that's happening in the room, the longings, the fear, those significant attachment handles that are loaded. We want to repeat those, and here's why we want to repeat those. The ones that have attachment significance, attachment-related emotion tied to it is what we want to be repeating, and here's why. In the moment when their brain is feeling it, they probably don't even always notice it or hear it themselves. This is going a little bit to, uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting this work, but Gendlin's work where he talks about experience. And what Gendlin talks about in experiencing is it's not just one thing to say you feel something or talk about what you feel. What Gendlin will do is he'll slow you down, have you come back and say something like, could you put your hand on your diaphragm and say it again? What he's wanting to try and do is get you to drop into actually experience your words. And that's what I think repetition does. It allows the client to experience the words that are coming out of their world. This is like what Sue says, we're holding up a mirror to their inner world and letting them experience it. And so repetition, so we wanna repeat those attachment related significant emotional parts so that way it can actually become alive in them. They can experience it. So we can experience it. So that's one of the importance of it and what we're trying to repeat. And we're trying to do it when the emotion is really live. I look for limbic markers when they say it. When they say it, do they take a deep breath? Do their shoulders drop? Do their eyes drop? That tells me, uh uh-oh, what just came out of their mouth, what they just experienced, it's important here. Run it back past them a couple times. Let it wash over you, James. I'm sometimes repeating so I can let it come alive in me. This is where we think we've talked about in this podcast. We want to make the full catch of the moment, right? Um, And then also what we're doing repetitiveness is in that moment, their brain is maybe in the limbic part, in the fear, in the pain. When you reflect it back the first time, they might not even catch that it happened. So you're probably going to have to do it two, three, and Ryan's going to tell us about a story here in a moment, maybe eight times for their brain, for their limbic system to ever take in the comfort or the fact that you are really attuned with them. 
especially in clinically significant distress relationships, guess what they've been used to? People not being attuned with them. It not being safe to let their emotions come out. When we're being repetitive, what we're doing is, I do see you. No, I really, let me, let me make sure I really got this. Yes, this is really hard. Oh, can we stay again? This is also that kind of that EFT intervention. Can I stay right here? Can I go back? I really know this is really coming alive in me. And letting them see it, not only hear us say it, but hopefully we're dropping each time we do the repetition, if, the, if, the, if that's in a tuned way, to show them like, whoa, it's really here. It almost, it almost becomes in some way we're massaging, we're doing what we do with the baby. We're letting our words and our presence be that hand that pats them on the back in the moment when they're in distress. I don't know what's coming up for you there, Ryan. It's good thoughts. I like it. Um, I come from a background of, of playing sports and uh, I played a lot of baseball and I played a little bit of golf, neither of which do I play at all now. But let me tell you something those two things have in common. They're really, really hard to do. They say that hitting a baseball is the hardest thing in all sports. Um, and I can tell you that hitting a golf ball straight is quite difficult. You know, and marketers figure that out. They really do. Marketers figure that out. So if you, if you Google training, do it for me, listener. Uh, Google uh, training aid for hitting a golf ball or training aid for hitting a baseball. You will find hundreds of thousands of these little inventions that like ties your shoulder together or makes your movement this way or moves your hips left right before you swing the bat. And, um, you know, they're fine. I'm sure they're somewhat helpful here and there, but I've never seen a good golfer or a good baseball player say, yep, it was that gimmick. It was that one little tool that made me uh, good at this sport. And I think our profession is a little bit like that too. Mm. We're always on the lookout for this resource, this sort of crazy outside the box intervention that's going to solve our client's distress. And I don't mean anything negative towards those things. If I've said on here before, if someone's out trying to be creative on how to help people, we're on the same team. And hey, bless them. I hope that I hope it works. But in the end, it's not the fanciness of your interventions. It's not this super cool new age resource that usually works. It's the humanistic, basic, simple way of being together to, to refocus um, attention and to make shifts in one's experience of self and other that creates real lasting change. And uh, that can't happen without repetition. It's not possible. Just what you were saying, when someone is in distress, they're upregulated, their body's in fight or flight mode. So the first few times you make a really good intervention, you should probably note, they didn't hear me. <laughs> Even when clients nod their head, they didn't hear you. Okay. If I'm drowning and I'm flailing out there, which is, you know, that does kind of sound like my swim technique. <laughs> and you say something about move to your left or something. I'm just like, you may think I've heard you, but I haven't heard you. And so repetition, simplicity, our presence, those are usually the best interventions. You know, and classically in EFT circles, if you've been to externship or more, and if you haven't, this might be new for you, is, a, is an acronym. I know that's what people want on here, more acronyms. <laughs> that was sarcasm. But it's an old acronym. It's been around for at least 20 years that I know of, and that is our risk voice. Sue Johnson would say, uh, your risk voice is how you're responding to your clients on a regular basis, right? So let's skip the R. You know, the, 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 the metaphor or the, I'm sorry, the acronym is using images softening, slowing, using simple words. Becca Jorgensen added somatic, I like that. The C is using client's exact words or conjecture. But the R is where it all starts, mm -hmm. and that is repetition. Right. So that's the first letter of our, our acronym in EFT. EFT is a repetitive, slow model. As soon as we can get around escalation, it's slow, it's repetitive, we're doing the same things over and over and over until it hits, until it installs. So I want to go with what, what Ryan's saying. I just heard my couple say this to me yesterday. And I said, hey, 
I sorry, I know I kept join, uh, jumping in there and I kept being repetitive because there was a point where they rolled their eyes at me. And I felt a little silly if I'm going to be honest. But I was like, I knew just something in my eyes and my gut said, we got to stay here. I got to really let this sink into them. And at the end of the session, they were like, yeah, I know. But you did exactly what we can't do at home and what we need. You help slow us down. And, and we don't normally allow ourselves to kind of connect with certain parts that you highlighted for us. So I think that's the, the part about it. Repetition. Here's the key I want to say to it, though. You know, people say, well, won't people think we're silly? This is something I heard you say early in my training, Ryan. Uh, the key is when you're in pain, repetition is actually soothing and calming. So the key is we do this risk and we do the repetition actually in live emotional experience. We're not using risk like a, I don't know why this image came up to me. We're not trying to be a snake charmer, <laughs> right? We're not trying to use it to manipulate the client into a place that they're not really at. We're using it on the leading edge of their vulnerability to help them stay in it, to help them experience it, to help them drop in it when it's there. If you listen to our podcast, this is on the two paths. If they're not in that place, we're organizing and we're trying to put it together. But if they drop, we're going to go to this risk place and repeat, 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 right, to help them do that. It's good stuff. I have more to say in a story coming back after these messages. You can donate to this podcast on Venmo or Cash App, both at Doc LPC. Once again, Venmo and Cash App at Doc Hawk LPC. We so appreciate your partnership as we've grown and are engaging more people. We've been contacted by folks to try to monetize this. We really don't want to do that. We love to bring this dialogue to you for free. One of the ways that we do that is to ask for your partnership with your money. We get better equipment. We're able to spend more time. So we so appreciate you being with us on the Leading Edge in Emotionally Focused Therapy. And once again, hey, so sorry, I jumped in on that commercial. <laughs> uh, but I, would, I do want to say thank you. You know, people have been giving. And because of that, we have made some upgrades. And here's why we made the upgrades. A lot of, you know, what people have said to me, Ryan, is there's a part where our voices have become like attachment figures to them. Um, in the moments when they just really have been struggling in today's culture and world where just we're, we're hurting as people that actually in some ways our voices have become soothing kind of comfort for them. So uh, James did upgrade the microphones. Um, James has also ordered a new, you don't know, we have a new board too, Ryan. They upgraded this board. So we're going to oh, change it out. Nice. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Uh, but because Ryan and I, we do, um, you know, we're not trying to get rich off of this thing, and we're not, <laughs> but we do take it seriously about trying to bring the best product content-wise, but also experiential-wise. As you know, for our clients, tone of voice conveys a lot in, of message and meaning. So we're going to try to do the best to give you the clearest, cleanest sound uh, since this podcast matters to you all. So thank you for making that possible. That's a lovely thought, James. I was, I know I'm feeling guilty. <laughs> our voices are an attachment figure. That's pretty cool. I was just sitting there thinking that your new headphones look really cool on you, and I still got old headphones. <laughs> Let's play that commercial again. <laughs> you know why I did it? Because like I'm like I'm taking it seriously. People yeah. keep saying like, "Hey," so I'm like, "So these headphones are specifically designed that's... to hear true audio quality of what it will sound like on the other side." So that's why I did it. All right, we take you all seriously. We really, really do. So thank you all so much. Anyway, very true. So, all right. So repetition. What What are we repeating? I just wrote down four or five thoughts here. It's pretty obvious, but it, it bears, it does bear repeating, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, if someone says, hey, I went out all weekend and ate a lot of chocolate, you don't have to use your risk voice and be like, okay. I see this on occasion that when the EFT hears, <laughs> okay, so you spent the weekend eating lots and lots of chocolate, right? That would be a misuse of your risk voice. And if you're talking at that pace and that, and that tone, and that's not your natural way of connecting with people, you've actually wasted uh, your vulnerability mm. trying to answer something that's not vulnerable. So we want to save that juice. We want to save our repetition and, and our deeper presence on things that are attachment significant. So, so attachment meaning model of self, model of other, involves emotion about connection, either real or imagined. Mm -hmm. That's, I just defined an attachment as best as I could there. Uh, also the w w wins, when some within, within attachment, when 
you're in attachment and the way it's being discussed feels very, very chaotic. That's a cue for me. A lot of repetition right here is needed. Mm -hmm. Or this is extremely common when there's a vulnerable attachment emotion and you see your client speed up, that is them saying, I need you to bring me back here. I need you to be very, very repetitive with me because something about this feels so scary and so disorganized. I don't even know how to stay here. And that's why I'm suffering. Please help me. Wouldn't it be nice if your clients told you that? But thankfully, we are telling you that on our new microphones. Um, <laughs> and just the last thing I wrote down is, is attachment stuff, uh, longings, little subtle, deep events that don't often get talked about, that don't often get noticed. That's your client's way of saying, I need you to help me slow down and, and be repetitive in this place. What would you add or take away to that, James? Man, you know, we keep trying to be so clear and so clean and so practical. I like that repetitiveness can slow. It can help them drop into more of their experience. And it also highlights attachment significant moments. That's what we're really trying to use it um, in this moment. And for me, it's like a repetitiveness. You know, I know I've said it before, but I think it is big. It gives me as, an, as a therapist an opportunity to experience it. I love, and it brings the present moment so alive. I remember sitting and watching one of Leanne Campbell's, which we've had her on the podcast. We'd love to have her back. Uh, she does such a good job when that moment happens and she just keeps reflecting and repeating it and repeating. And sometimes that can be hard because you can see, this is maybe from my nursing days. There are some things we had to do in the, in, in the nursing field that actually brings some pain to a patient. But we're doing that, and it feels like it's heightening it, but there's relief on the other side. And I do see for some EFTers that sometimes they, that they might stay away from repetition because they see the tears begin to drop and fall. They see the pain come across their face. But guess what? That pain has already been there. <laughs> and I like, you know, I'm going to steal from what Ryan just said for a moment, and he's probably going to use it again, probably going to your story but it's helping to take the stinger out, the stinger of being alone with the pain, the stinger of being alone with the fear. And what looked like a bee that was gonna hurt everybody, actually is just another, it's probably like a ladybug who wants to help your garden flourish. I don't know, that's what I got there. I like it. You know, so I'm over here writing this stuff down. Why do we repeat? I just call, I just used a non-sporting or war metaphor type an image in metaphor. there. I used, I used your book. I guess I kind of took yours, but I turned it into a ladybug. That's anyway. all right. That's all right. I was going to use a more dangerous animal. <laughs> yeah, so seven or eight reasons to repeat. When you find an attachment significant area that usually they speed up, it's very chaotic, it's often not noticed, and you come back and you repetitively reflect some pieces we're going to talk about what those pieces are last, but why? Number one, it's very, very normalizing. And, and what's probably most normalizing is your tone of voice as you reflect it. It's contextualizing. Mm -hmm. If I feel ashamed over my experience and you put it in context for me, it instantly implies you are not crazy. You are not bad which has an effect, number three, of slowing me down. If I'm not being attacked, I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to change the subject. I don't have to speed up and tell you one more reason why I do X, Y, or Z, which is an exit, by the way. A big one, it organizes things. Intense emotional places are inherently chaotic and that chaos creates chaos, which creates chaos, which creates more self-protection, which creates more cycles and puts a relationship in a disease state. So the opposite is true. When we find the right focus and we, when we do repetitive reflections, it organizes it, it slows it down, and it makes a space for a shift. Um, repetition allows for the therapist's validation to land and start to install. Repetition allows the therapist's validation to land and begin to install. And in that way, you have done the opposite of leaving them alone in pain. You have joined them. And uh, back to the animal species. Um, they used to tell you if, you if you're bitten by a snake, you should, you should bite into it and suck out the venom. 
um, don't do that. That was bad advice, okay? No extra charge. No extra charge for this, but that's bad advice. Don't. Ryan, the survivalist guy. Yeah, now. yeah. Don't do that. But repetition at the right at the right time and with a fully attuned therapist who's emotionally available and is reflecting and validating, it pulls the poison out of these painful places. And this area that was formerly poisoned, always creating the next cycle, if you can pull the poison, some of the pain out of this place with your repetition and with your presence, the next time it comes by, it's going to be a very different response set. Want me to keep going? Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you a story uh, which was most impactful with me on this simply because the client um, at the end of the session had some, some poignant things to say. So several years ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, one afternoon – I had clients, uh, again, within about a four-hour window, I had clients have nine panic attacks in, in one afternoon. That was a little more than, than I was used to. And um, so that's fine. We're always learning. Uh, one of them was in a, 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 an intake session. And, you know, I was just like still going over the paperwork and everything. And so that, that person had been going through a lot, as you can imagine. And in that moment... Um, I chose to do stabilization sort of things, right? Can you feel your feet on the ground? Can you feel your back on the chair? Can you just trying to get that person present and it worked fine and everything went fine. The very next session though was a couple and uh, one of the partners uh, was a therapist, uh, actually quite an excellent therapist. And uh, we were just like tracking around what was going on with them. They really were in a pretty good place. But um, the right trigger was triggered. And instantly this person began to have, uh, I would say, two or three panic attacks right in that moment. So I had to make another judgment call. And uh, I chose not to do stabilization with this person in that moment. I'm not suggesting you should or shouldn't. It's just a call that I made. I, I made that call because I felt like we had enough alliance. I felt like we had enough safety. I felt like their partner was fairly supportive. And I'm like, okay, this person's feeling out of control and panicking. Instead of stabilization, I want to do utilization. I want to see if I can use this panic to create something new. And so um, what I did was super, super fancy. That's extreme sarcasm. <laughs> um, I, I hate to say it this way. It sounds so impersonal, but I ran temp eight times in a row. And it took almost a whole session. I say ran temp. I hate to say it that way. But I really uh, continued to go with her, uh, this person's panic experience. And I tried to put it in context uh, with the danger cue or the trigger from her partner. And then um, I sorted across over to what this danger cue meant to this person, which was quite dangerous made me feel panicky just to see the connection there which is exactly what we want and then we back down um, into the the both secondary and primary emotion none of those words that I actually use by the way this was just my kind of guide so we went trigger we did attachment message I'm a t-mepper so temp t-m-e-p or t-e-m-p whatever um, so it was a trigger over to the message, into the really vulnerable pain, and into this person's action tendency. And I bathed every single piece of that with, with my presence, leaning forward. I did full reflection and full validation over every single element of that assembly. And then I did it again. And then I did it again. And then I did it again. And I had some enactments I could have done, but that didn't seem like the right move. So after the fifth time, I repeated the exact same, the exact same danger cue. And by the way, the partner was giving me plenty of signals that the partner was fine. That they weren't dysregulated. It was so anyway, there was just lots of good uh, reasons why I did that, or I think they were good. Um, and I wouldn't do it every time. But on the fifth time I began to repeat this, both of them would smile. It's as if they're saying, we're doing this again, huh? And I'm like, yep. And I would reassemble the whole thing. And then I would stop. And then we would smile again. And I would reassemble it again. And reassemble. So the eighth time we reassembled this, um, we did a small enactment. 
um, the, and we finished a mission. And then at the end, we're towards the end of the session there. And this therapist client says to me, I cannot believe that affected me that way. And I'm like, what do you mean? And um, the therapist client says, you, you repeated this place over and over and over. And it's like every time you did that, it slowed it down. It, it gave me a sense of control over it. It took away how out of control this was. It was the repetition that just changed this place. It's like I'm, I'm stunned how different I feel about this place when you just repeated this over and over and over. And so um, the session's coming back to me now. So I was just saying, let's look at how that makes good sense. When this happens out in the wild, you spend an unbelievable amount of energy trying to make it stop, right? Which is really not how you want to work with your own emotion. <laughs> because when you try to make your emotion stop, it intensifies. And this has never been safe for you. And we have these histories from your attachment history. So look at all the good reasons that your body speeds up right when we need to slow it down. So it was the repetition. I don't, and, and this is something I think is, is pretty common. Eight's a lot, Okay. I'm not saying that you should run a temp assembly, um, uh, affect assembly eight times every session on one side. Um, that was a judgment call based on um, the sensation in that session. But I think it is common that the first time or two that you assemble temp, therapists often think it's clear. They may even have it written down, or maybe you're someone who uses a dry erase board. I don't, but if you do, whatever it is, whatever works. But they often think that they have it, and they don't have it. Not only that, your clients may even have it some cognitively. But it's a very different thing to catch it emotionally. What was good about that session, and certainly not all my sessions are that way. I don't mean to tell a braggy session here. It was just poignant because of her comments. I don't think I even noticed it until she commented on it as much. Um, what was poignant is um, that it was the repetition that allowed her to feel like, hey, I am having a normal response to something that hurts. I'm not crazy. I'm not out of control. I don't have to like get stronger, get more differentiated, and make sure this doesn't happen again. My body had very, very obviously sensical, normal responses to a hard thing. And once, and once someone catches that in their body, it's very, very difficult to continue to have panic attacks. Man, I like that story, Ryan. I'm sitting here. I had to slow down and really just take it in. And I, I think if you get – I hope what you can take away from this podcast, even you know we have the list here, but – I hope this empowers you to be repetitive. Even when you get the smile, even if they kind of roll their eyes, what you are doing, this is why I love what Sue says. It's not attachment theory anymore. This is attachment science. Your repetitiveness is like the physical therapist who brings you in and has you do repeated movements to elongate and realign ligaments and muscles. The repetitiveness is necessary for the neurological system. This is a part of the wiring. This is a part of the safety. This is a part of the experiencing. And even for this intelligent, talented human being that you were working with, Ryan, who obviously didn't need you to teach her anything, her body just needed a new experience to say, it's okay. Me feeling this way, my body putting out this signal is a very adaptive thing for me to do. That was, I don't know, I love that story. I do too. I do too. Um, and, you know, it, I flashed to a, a movie, a great movie called Good Will Hunting with the late Robin Williams. There's this really poignant scene where he uses repetition as a way to evoke, right, this, this client. Uh, man, I've forgotten his name now. Anyway, it's Matt Damon. You know, he has this childhood trauma, and, and Robin Williams says, it's not your fault. And he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. He's like, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault, right? And it really evoked this new experience. So there's different ways to evoke new experience. I loved your illustration there. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get better from this podcast today. I don't, I don't even know who you were talking about. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say that. Gil, Gilly? Gilly? Not, not Paul Guillory. I don't know. 
I can't remember now what we're talking about. Well, Leanne? No, no, no. You said you said when someone says something, but it seem, they seem distant from it, to put your hand over like your Oh, hand. oh, Gendlin. Gendlin. Uh, yeah, folk, yeah, I forgot what his theory was. But yeah. uh, when we talk about the levels of experiencing scale, yeah. he's one of the researchers behind that. I got you. See, it's, that's embarrassing that I don't know that. But don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a way to do repetition. You know, you got Robin Williams' way by evoking, by having this existential encounter with someone to repeat it, to, to, to draw emphasis. You know, I was using repetition to slow it, to calm it, to organize it. Um, he, he said you could put your hand over your diaphragm to, to ask you to pay attention to it. A silly thing that I do a lot is I blame myself. Mm. I know this is repetitive. I need to get this really, really clear. Would you mind helping me? And clients are good to be like, oh, okay, if it's helping you not knowing that it's probably also impacting them. <laughs> um, but the one I use most often, I'm not too fancy, is I just, when someone says something a time or two and, and my indicator is they don't actually feel that or they're like hurrying by that, is just to say, uh, hang on a minute, can you do me a weird favor? Can you close your eyes? Mm. Can I ask you just to pay attention to that for a minute? Just 30 seconds. I'll, I'll just sit over here. I just want you to pay attention to that. And that, and that has an evoking... Uh, organizing effect as well. So there's probably many ways to do this. I was re repetitious with assembly. You could certainly be repetitious with vulnerable emotion. You could be, um, one of my favorites is um, when a partner reaches over for comfort and the, the, the party, the sharing partner um, feels their hand, but not really. And I'm like, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Can, can you feel their hand and it's surprising how often they say no mm. i'm like well without saying this i'm like well we ain't leaving until you do so like we're going to stay here we're going to repeat that can i ask you to close your eyes can i ask you to pay attention can you feel warmth what does their skin feel like can you feel it when uh she moves her finger like i'm really trying to get the body to pay attention to have that sort of redemptive corrective experience I like this. And I really hope like you get the power and, you know, we've got, there's so many things you can repeat this, the reflection, the assembly component, the valid, the emotional phrases is just allowing them to experience something that the cycle normally does not let them experience is what we're really getting down to with this. Uh, and we want to empower you as a therapist. It could feel awkward, but there is a scientific proven reason why you're doing what you're doing. And I know for some therapists, it's like, but I don't want them to think I'm silly, like I'm lost, like I don't know. No, you know. And remember, you're the process facilitator. You're the one that's the stronger, wiser other in this moment. You're doing it with a very valid reason. And um, so I hope this helps empower you on this, something that's like Ryan said, not super complicated. We know the leading edge is not always something new and brilliant. It is taking the simple but powerful things that are effective with our clients. So thank you for having this conversation with us. Appreciate you. Thank you for listening. We hope this experience helps you push the leading edge in your work to help people connect with themselves and with each other. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a five-star review. You can contact us at pushtheleadingedge at gmail.com and you can follow us on our Facebook page at Push the Leading Edge. You can follow Ryan on Facebook at Ryan Rayner Professional Training and on his website, RyanRaynerTraining.com. You can follow James on Facebook and Instagram at DocHawkLPC. You can also check out his website, DocHawkLPC.com. Music